Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. I am Beth McGinn, the McPAP manager. Welcome to the McPAP Clinical Conversations that takes place on the fourth Tuesday of each month from 12.15 to 1.15. But note that we will not be hosting a clinical conversation in the months of July or August is after the screen, a practical approach to mental health assessment in the pediatric primary care setting. Housekeeping items. The session will be recorded and available on the McPAP website, which is www.mcpap.org. PowerPoint slides will be available on the McPAP website and archive news and webinars page under Pap. Because of mute, if you have a question or a comment, please type it into the question box during the presentation and we'll read your question. Our presenters may stop for questions during the presentation and there will also be time at the end. You can receive a survey following the presentation. And we appreciate your feedback to help us improve our future presentations. Which presenter is Dr. Barry Servette. Dr. Servette is a professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, Bay State, a graduate of Northwestern University's Honors Program in Medical edu Education. He completed his residency training in both general and child adolescent psychiatry at Yale University. Dr. has focused on the development and operation of models promoting the integration of child psychiatry in primary care and the dissemination of best practices in mental health treatment. Wide medical director of the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Program, McPAP, he guided leadership in the development of an, and implementation of programs since the inception in, 19, in 2004. The McPAP of the systematic provisions of child psychiatry, consultation, education, and coordination for pediatric primary care providers has re replicated in many states across the U.S. Dr. Sir has written numerous articles regarding the integrated child psychiatry practice and provided technical assistance for programs throughout the U.S. striving to develop their own systems of collaboration between child psychiatry and primary care. Also helped found the National Network of Child Psychiatry Access Programs, which currently includes 32 states. That work has focused on addressing the needs of children that have been impacted by traumatic stress. He provided leadership for the Bay State Children's, Bay State Children's Hospital Family Advocacy Center a clinical and research program for children who have victims of child abuse, domestic violence, and other forms of trauma. In thing, he leads federal-funded projects for the dissemination and adaptation of evidence-based trauma-focused psychotherapy models within the community mental health settings. Dr. Savet currently serves as the co-chair on the American Academy of Children and Adolescent Psychiatry. Access <clears throat> Healthcare Access and Economic Committee, co chair of the Mental Health Task Force of the Massachusetts Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics. He serves as the American Psychiatric Association Integrated Child Care Committee and the APA uh, Science Program Committee. Dr. Set serves as a national trainer in the collaborative care model when the APA's Transforming Clinical Practice and is funded by the Federal Centers for Medical Care and Medicaid Services. Welcome him. Thanks, uh, Beth, and um, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I will get right into um, our topic today. Um, this issue about assessment is um, in my opinion, uh, something that we um, really haven't talked about as much as we should. I, I kind of think it's like a, it's like the missing link uh, between um, screen and treatment, and and I think that there there can be a tendency, especially 
for practices that don't have uh, integrated behavioral health providers, um, there can be a tendency to kind of bypass the assessment and kind of rush into treatment. And, and, and we encourage people to, to think think more about assessment, or, or and which has historically and kind of traditionally been the, the domain of, of psychiatry. But um, knowing that uh, psychiatry is really a major part of, of primary care, um, you know, we really want to spend some time to think about assessment. Um, can we go on to the next slide? And for the case vignette, um, we're going to talk about, uh, and, and, and I'm very mindful of the, the changes and the limitations of uh, the primary care setting in terms of time. And so this, this is to be a um, kind of a pared down um, kind of format for, a, for an assessment uh, that's really meant to kind of cover the bases um, in primary care setting. And so we're going to start with uh, talking about targeted history of present illness, a history, clinical interview, and impression planning. Uh, so, so we're sort of breaking it down into four components. And then uh, hopefully we'll have time for discussion and questions. Uh, next slide. So Max. Um, so Max is a 12-year-old uh, who, who presents to the pediatrician uh, with uh, the chief complaint um, uh, expressed by the parent of uh, inattention and disruptive behavior problems at school. And actually, the school um, uh, requested an ADHD evaluation. Uh, he had a change in school, and, and they didn't know him very well, and, and he presented uh, with these symptoms, and, and they suspected that he needed uh, to be evaluated for ADHD. Uh, Interval rating scales were completed, um, and they were strongly positive for both proactive and inattentive symptoms. Um, the clinician gathered a history, uh, helpfully, uh, which indicated that, that the symptoms that, that were validated on the survey and that were put to school are, are really new um, and really have just been occurring in the last year. Uh, additional history provided um, by the parent indicated that, um, that uh, the, the overwhelming um, concern at home had to do with uh, negativity, um, particularly irritability, um, complaining about unfairness, um, becoming drawn from friends and family, uh, and, and the clinician also gathered that there was a strong family history of depression, uh, mother, maternal aunt, maternal grandfather, and that there was a recent loss of, of a family um, and that that was particularly devastating to that. Uh, there was a clinical interview um, in the in the in the visit, and and in the clinical interview, the the child disclosed feeling sad and hopeless all the time, and some passive suicidal thoughts, and and want help. It seemed like he's motivated for help. Thank you, Jeremy. So this next slide is a reminder. Um, if you haven't seen it, you can see this on the website. But this is our our algorithm for depression. And if you click uh, ahead, uh, Jeremy, um, you'll see, there you go. So I'm sort of zooming in on uh, the uh, part of the algorithm. It really talks about the movement from, from screening uh, to treatment. Um, and and there's, there's the use of the pain health questionnaire for the PHQ-9 uh, as part of the assessment of depression. Um, but it's clear that uh, the recommendation in the algorithm is that um, there is a concern for depression if the screen is positive, that there needs to be uh, a focused assessment. Uh, one more time, uh, Jeremy. The indicates that there needs to be a focus assessment uh, which addresses uh, precipitating factors, uh, uses family rating scale or symptom rating scales, and uh, family history of mood disorders, et cetera. Um, next slide. So that slide with the algorithm really sort of locates this conversation about assessment. Um, in general, I think it's really important for us all to remember that um, screening is not the same as, as assessment. Um, that screening instruments are really designed uh, to capture um, patients who have a likelihood uh, of having a diagnosis, but they're really not, not um, 
definitive uh, diagnostic instruments. Um, and, and the reason for that is that, is that the screening instruments really have high sensitivity and, and not very high specificity. They're really designed to capture uh, cases, um, but, but screens don't worry or people the, the use of a screen uh, implies that, that, that you're, you're going to assess further to really identify whether there's a diagnosis. The other purpose of, of assessment is really for clinical engagement. Um, and I would argue that even if you have um, a great behavioral health provider in your practice, that uh, if you as a primary care provider are going to be uh, medicating a child or, or engaging in follow-up, and, and, and sort of declaring a, a doctor-patient relationship around this particular problem, uh, but, uh, having some process of, of getting to understand uh, directly, you know, what you're treating is important uh, for the therapeutic relationship. Yeah. A little bit about time management, uh, and, and we will talk about that more in the, in the discussion, but uh, the implication is that, uh, that, that you're going to um, have limited time, so, so this process is really meant to be streamlined. I encourage you to involve the integrated behavioral, behavioral health provider and also uh, throughout the process consider consulting with PAP. Um, and and so, so there really are three ways to get, you know, an assessment. You know, one way is to do it yourself. Another way is to have an integrated behavioral health provider do an assessment, you know, in, in your office. Uh, and then another way is to, to get MCPAP to do a face-to-face -face evaluation and obviously MCPAP uh, um, it's uh, uh, staff to the capacity to be able to provide all the assessments that are needed to, to treat all the kids in, in the primary care system. Uh, certain kids that we want to be doing face-to-face -face assessments, uh, especially if there are significant ambiguities and, and complexities in terms of the diagnosis. So uh, we want to talk about um, some of the developmental differences in terms of uh, how you structure the assessment in regard to the involvement of parents. Uh, it's a little bit different for children uh, and for adolescents, um, uh, but uh, we can talk about that as we go along. Um, for, for children, um, the pet um, would be involved uh, uh, more intensively uh, in the history-taking uh, part of the, um, the session. Um, and for adolescents, um, you might uh, include the parent uh, uh, a little bit less and, and really give the adolescent more of your time to uh, be able to construct this history. You certainly don't want to exclude the parent in an adolescent uh, evaluation because the parent uh, needs to be engaged and, and has important insights uh, to our course. Uh, so here's how we, um, in just terms of uh, structuring the interview, as I said, there's four parts to think of. Um, the first point to make about this is that we strongly encourage people to dedicate um, 20, 30 minutes of time um, to have a focus visit. And, and uh, you can you tell me in the, in the discussion. Uh, but uh, I, I would argue that, that um, you know, if you're doing assessment uh, for a new problem that you didn't know about before that has it's a significant you know, chronic mental health problem, that, um, you know, it's just like if you have a, a new diabetic, um, or you have a patient with um, kind of a, uh, who didn't really have a, a, a focus, you know, diagnostic uh, process. Um, and, and it takes, uh, takes some time. Sometimes it can take 20 minutes. Uh, psychiatrists take an hour. When I was in training, we took six hours <laughs> to evaluation. Um, but, um, you know, if, if you're dealing with uh, relatively straightforward uh, cases, uh, we believe you could do it in, in 20 minutes. Um, and then if it, if it seems like you're not getting uh, there in the process and if you feel like um, that's not enough time, that's really kind of a good criteria for calling the PAP and saying, look, we need you to do face-to-face uh, -face because we can't really sort this out. It's really not practical to sort this out in, in a primary care setting. And so, so the four parts, as I said, are history taking, um, clinical review, uh, uh, of course, considering the telephone consultation, and, and then the end uh, of the session, it's important to have uh, some time set aside within, within the focus of visit for feedback and, and negotiation of uh, treatment plan options. Jeremy, next slide. So let's start with the present illness. Um, 
The nice uh, thing about having a screen or having uh, an evaluation instrument uh, for the for the, the assessment of the symptom that's presenting is that um, that it, it the positive findings on a screen can sort of be a nice way to get started with uh, taking a history of present illness, and it can sort of put the initial structure for the conversation. So, so we recommend um, you don't have to do it this way, uh, but a nice, efficient way is really to, to, to utilize the, the swing instrument as your initial structure. And you look at some of the positive findings on the screening instrument and you ask, you know, the traditional medical history questions about those symptoms. When did it start? How long has it been going on? How quickly are the symptoms occurring? Uh, what, is the what is the quality of the symptoms? Um, actually, I like to, uh, to ask, uh, what's it like? Uh, it's sort of a simple uh, vernacular uh, term um, just to find out the quality. Uh, and, and I might ask that to the, to the child or the teenager uh, during the visit, uh, just so I can get a sense of what it feels like uh, to have the symptoms. You know, how severe is it? Um, asking about triggers and stressors. Triggers um, applies often to uh, PTSD-like symptoms, because lots of symptoms in PTSD are triggered uh, reactions. Um, uh, but but it also kind of uh, refers oftentimes to anxiety symptoms. People have anxiety that's triggered, uh, and, and depressive symptoms can be triggered. Stressors are a little bit more kind of in the kind of atmosphere around the child or in the recent history. Uh, and and we'll talk about trauma later, but that's another piece of that's really important to include. But but for HPI, I think it's 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 really helpful to ask about stressors that uh, could be contributing, or that people they may may be contributing to the symptoms that are being presented. I also for examples to make it real so people tell me about different difficulties that they have um, and it seems kind of abstract and it's kind of not you know clear to me then I'll, I'll say can you give me an example of, uh, of an incident or something that happened that uh, really sort of represents um, an example of what you're talking about. Uh, after the initial uh, history is you know, associated with um, the presenting symptoms, uh, it's very helpful to zoom out a little bit and do a brief psychiatric review systems. And, and when you do a psychiatric review systems, it's good to think about the differential and think about some of the comorbid uh, diagnoses that could be uh, related to the problem. And that's where your knowledge, your growing knowledge about uh, psychiatric uh, diseases um, really comes into play. Uh, next slide, Jeremy. We actually have a set of um, so clinical pearls. Um, these are documents that are associated with our algorithms. And, and some of the information in this table are, is included on those clinical pearl documents. And the clinical pearl documents are really meant to kind of go behind, go a little bit deeper than, than the algorithm to talk about sort of some of the, the fine points of, of assessment and management and, and monitoring. But for depression, it's keep in mind that uh, in the differential, you know, you should consider bipolar disorder in the differential. For, for anything, you should consider trauma, practically, because <laughs> it causes mood symptoms, anxiety symptoms, behavior symptoms. Uh, so, so PTSD should be the, in the differential. Anxiety and depression often are kind of intermixed, and sometimes people have both, sometimes one or the other is the main diagnosis, but um, but when working someone up from depression, um, it's good to ask questions about anxiety and, and, and vice versa. Uh, ADHD can cause uh, difficulty concentrating, as is uh, implied in the case that I presented at the beginning. Uh, depression sometimes uh, presents, uh, uh, and, it, and it turns out that it's an adjustment disorder. Um, and so, so the, the difference between depression and adjustment disorder is based uh, primarily on how long it's been going on, and 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 um, and so on the severity. Um, people have a criteria for major depression, even if it's an adjustment to a stressor, it's still considered to be major depression. Uh, early psychosis. Sometimes patients with early psychosis present with um, withdrawn, isolated behavior, difficulty concentrating, deterioration in functioning that can appear like depression. It's certainly not as common as depression, but, but it's going to keep that in the back of your mind and, and you can ask questions about that as you go along. For HD, uh, the high 
hyperactivity that people have ADHD can um, we sort of uh, uh, be a from from mania and 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 so so mania is something that that's sort of occurs uh, and it's not something that's like a developmental uh, kind of syndrome the way the ADHD is, is so if there's a sudden onset of hyperactivity and increased energy then that'd be a red flag that should kind of pique your interest in asking other questions about mania which we'll talk about a little bit later PTSD as we said can cause um, uh, dysregulated behavior and anxiety and um, patient and, and restlessness and, and distractibility, so that should be considered as well. Uh, ODD um, is another uh, possibility that causes this disruptive behavior, but uh, it could go be coexisting and often is coexisting with ADHD, but it should be also considered. We talked about anxiety, we also talked about early psychosis. And, and then finally, for anxiety disorders, we talked about some of the connections between anxiety and depression and ADHD and SD, but, but also autism, that sometimes cases of high-functioning autism can present symptoms of anxiety um, because patients with autism are often uh, nervous about um, social interactions, obviously, and, and also have um, a tendency to uh, become agitated and, and anxious about a number of different kinds of things. Uh, one more slide. Thank you. So, so the HPI um, and, and psychiatric review systems, which is really an extension of the HPI, um, just to step back and to gather, this is the second phase. So there's HPI, the second phase is really the, the background history. Um, and there's different categories, but uh, the way that I tend to organize the questions I ask about this um, kind of uh, along these lines in the slide, that I always think about the three, I sort of divide kids' lives into three domains. Um, the first domain is, is home, the uh, domain is school, and the third domain is community, um, which includes uh, cultural and recreational kind of uh, relationships. So sometimes when you ask questions about these three domains, in, in general, asking people about, so how are things going at home? Tell me about how the how things are going at school and learning. Uh, tell me about how things are going in the community with friendships and activities and um, involvement in, in in the life of of, of your culture. Um, that you often find out about strengths, which are really important uh, for treatment planning, and also can give you sources of stressors that might not have been brought up in the HPI. Um, in the social history. Um, which is part of what I said about homeschool and community is certainly social history, but, but additional pieces of social history include uh, asking about adverse childhood experiences and trauma uh, was um, really important to know about. Of course, uh, substance abuse uh, is uh, an issue for, for kids uh, at a certain age, I would say above the age of 11 uh, or, or 12. Um, and hopefully you're thinking about substance abuse screening for these patients as well. And then the ability of firearms, that's, that's a, a, a specific granular point, but it's really good to kind of have a box in your EMR or something where whenever you're evaluating a patient with a psychiatrician to, you know, there's uh, a need to consider the risk of suicide and then the available firearms is really important uh, to know about, uh, when, especially if you have a patient that you're treating for a mood disorder. Um, medical developmental history, hopefully you already know that, uh, but you can kind of consider it as I in the patient. And then family psychiatric history, you might have other genetic history, but it's, it's to kind of ask questions about other members of the family who have any psychiatric conditions and to kind of make a note of that. Just slide. So the interview, um, this is kind of a part that sometimes gets skipped, especially for kids, um, for, for young kids. Uh, when you're having the history with the parent, um, you are also observing the child. The child may be participating in the discussion. Same thing could be true of the adolescent. Uh, but with the exception of very young children who have difficulty being separated from their parent and who might be uncomfortable with that, uh, or for people who are very have extreme anxiety, it's good to to have at least a few minutes really to talk to the child. Uh, more than 
spent a few minutes to talk to the adolescent. And again, this has the purpose of helping with engagement in a therapeutic relationship, which is a really important factor for uh, outcome that drives outcome in, in mental health treatment. Um, the mental status exam, which we're going to talk about next, uh, is something that you do during the clinical interview. Um, and uh, uh, spoiler alert, uh, it's not it's not a procedure. You know, it's, it's a part of an interview that you're having an interview, um, and it's uh, what you do in your head as you're talking to a child in terms of asking yourself certain questions about what what being and what you're experiencing with the child. Gastry of high-risk behavior is something that you can do privately, and it's not as accurate if you do it in the presence of the parent. And then, of course, you know, helping with the, the differential diagnosis, the clinical interview and the mental status exam, and in, in some cases really helps to clarify the differential diagnosis. So next slide, Jeremy. Um, so some of the so you. So you're with the child. Uh, Yourself, uh, and you're trying to uh, conduct an interview with the child. And um, uh, the, the where it starts, you do it after the history taking portion. Um, usually, the kids are, unless you have a, a steady, um, assertive uh, child, which is certainly the case sometimes, the uh, parent is often doing most of the talking. And, and so, so, after you ask the parent to leave the room, or if you bring the child into a consultation room, you might begin by asking the child uh, if he or she agrees with what uh, was said in the conversation with the parent present, um, and asking the child to help uh, you to understand, you know, what it's like, you know, from his or her perspective. Um, and some that's a nice little overture. It's an invitation to give you sort of an idea about what's been going on from his or her own point of view. It's it, and, and allows you to to really make a connection with a child. Um, and so once that starts, I mean, I think it can go where you want to go with that. Because the, the important thing in the, in the clinical interview is really just have, having a conversation, having an authentic uh, conversation about, you know, what's been going on. Uh, good to steer it, um, not just to talk about the problems, but also to talk about the strengths. Um, so you don't have to feel like you have to cover, you know, certain things um, a whole lot in the interview because it's your chance to to observations about the child's mental status and to understand how the child is thinking, uh, observe behavior, uh, uh, observe the communication. And so if you get a nice flow of a conversation going, uh, you might begin with the problems because that was what you were talking about in the history, but but I would pivot during that time to talk about strength, just because you the child to feel like you're seeing them as a whole person, uh, and you also want the child not to kind of sink into despair thinking about all the things going wrong and, and, and help the child to remember that there are good things, too, about themselves. And so the questions I ask about strengths are, you know, what kinds of things are going well in your life, and, and what things are you proud about? Out, uh, about yourself and, and about your family, just because you want to know all about them. Um, and that only takes a couple minutes. Um, uh, I think it's an important step. Uh, next slide, please. Self examination. Um, Times you that the diagnosis, most of the diagnostic criteria that we use in Citri are, are history based uh, criteria, things that people tell you about. The things that the child tells you about uh, his or her experience, and they're not things that we always observe. In fact, many of the times that we uh, evaluate children, the mental status condition is relatively normal. Um, so to have a normal mental status examination and have a patient with uh, pretty bad ADHD and you know pretty serious depression, um, you know, in terms of the observations of the child's speech and behavior and um, and thinking process and 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 those kinds of things, um, but but there are things you can find out that, that could be very important. Um, so, so the message here is that you're observing the behavior, the speech, the emotional expression of the child in the context of interactions um, uh, during the visit, um, and that the behavior might be uh, not representative of the behavior in their in vivo kind of natural environment. 
because they're nervous, they're on their best performance, and um, are very activated during a, a evaluation session. So, so don't uh, don't rule out a diagnosis on the basis of a normal uh, exam. Uh, and of course, that's uh, really important to explicitly assess for suicidal or homicidal ideation, and we'll talk about that. Uh, so Some of the categories of things that uh, you're going to be thinking about when you're interviewing the child, uh, trying to observe the attitude and behavior, you know, how connected are they, are, are they cooperative, respectful, disrespectful, um, do they seem regressed, immature, are they, they you know, dilated, impulsive, hyperactive, uh, of speech um, that you do want to observe um, the speech and, and try to, to reflect on on how much there is, whether there's poverty of speech, whether there's you know high volume of speech. Pressured speech is a word that we use a lot. And pressured means that that you can't get a child to stop talking, and you can't really get a child get in a word edgewise. And that's really what pressured means. Pressured is different from rapid speech because rapid is simply just the rate of speech. Pressured is the difficulty. It, that you have as an interviewer to bring in um, because there's so much force behind what they want to say that they don't give you a chance to participate. Um, prosody is an interesting one, and actually it's something that we think about a lot with autism spectrum disorders because prosody refers, refers to the melody of speech um, and the intonation and how the voice rises and falls in pitch. Um, questions are answered or, or asked, and 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 so so abnormal processing might, might be like robotic speech, where they, where where it sounds like um, like a computer voice. Um, mood and affect. Uh, some of the terms we use are constricted, labile, elevated, grandiose, um, hopelessness, or mood, affect kinds of um, words. Uh, thought process has to do with the connection between thought. And, and so we think about whether whether thoughts are logical or illogical, where they they naturally from one to the other, whether they're disorganized or tangential in terms of going off topic and and, and being kind of uh, um, pertinent uh, to the conversation. Um, when, when thoughts stop, uh, when you sort of have a thought, and all of a sudden it just uh, is dropped, and and uh, the child just becomes silent. And a lot of these uh, abnormalities are associated with early psychosis. Um, thought content, we talked about suicidality and homicidality, but other contents are obsessions and worries. Um, insight is important uh, and, and oftentimes uh, conditions that, 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 um, that abnormalities and insight are associated with abnormalities and insight uh, include media um, or uh, emotional immaturity, um, or uh, sometimes anxiety disorders, there's a lack of insight with young children because they they see fears as being all kind of dangerous outside of themselves and don't recognize that they themselves have an anxiety problem. And that we, I, I don't recommend that we ask judgment questions. I think that, that you can assess judgment by talking with a child and seeing uh, what they're saying is reflecting reasonable uh, thinking. Um, and, and so there are some questions you can ask about judgment, but uh, I don't think many of us uh, use them very much with kids because they're very, very full. And, and, and I think we can do a better job often of assessing judgment just by, by informal observation. Uh, next slide. So assessing suicidal ideation. Um, so I recommend uh, uh, when asking questions about suicidal to be very straightforward about it. Um, when I ask a question about it, I usually connect it um, with something that came up in the in the evaluation, either in the history or the, or the clinical interview. So, so if there's uh, if there was any talk about this or sad, hopelessness, uh, depressive symptoms, you can even connect that to a question about suicidal ideation. For example, you could say, "Oh, um, when you're about feeling depressed." Uh, I'd like to know if, if, if um, when feeling depressed, if you've ever had any any suicidal feelings. Um, but with, and, and you can use the word suicidal with uh, children uh, of a certain age. You know, I think you can use your judgment about that based on the developmental needs of the child. But but um, 
but uh, people I think uh, 10 years and older, I think most uh, kids, um, they know what you mean, you know, when you ask about that. And so, so why, why mince words? Um, and, uh, and, 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 and we feel very confident that when you ask about suicidal ideation, you're not uh, planting an idea, you know, that, that you're not going to create a risk that was not, not, not there and it's something to know about. So, so when I asked the question about it, I connected to something that came up, so it's not, you know, sort of coming up out of the blue and shocking or, or kind of um, unsettling um, to the world. And, uh, and then if they're, they're, the answer is, is yes, uh, or if the answer is um, not a, a definitive no, because <laughs> sometimes you get sort of an answer like uh, not really. Uh, so, so when you get really, it's important to follow that up and, and ask uh, what they mean and, and if they've ever had um, thoughts um, or plans or, or, or is. Um, uh, and, and then again, um, if you follow up on those things, if there are positive answers to those questions, it's good to, to ask um, about uh, planning and whether they've ever been on the verge, uh, whether they've uh, had the intention uh, being upon them. Um, it's good to ask them about what keeps them from acting uh, because it's a dynamic uh, issue. Uh, and it's actually very common for kids to have suicidal ideation from time to time and for, for all human beings to have suicidal ideation from time to time where thought might pass through your mind about uh, suicide. Um, and, uh, but, but the important thing is to know kind of what uh, would stop them um, from acting. Um, and then, and then safety planning. Whenever you start talking about suicide, it's good to to to, to include some discussion about what uh, might be a good safety plan. To if you were to have suicide that got worse, and where you were feeling like you were on the on the verge of doing something, or you had strong urgence, and you you were worried them and, and and felt nervous about them, uh, or felt uh, determined. Uh, what could you do? Um, and, and oftentimes that, that involves notifying people and developing a plan and, and, and making sure that the people that they would notify are the right people to know and know, have a good sort of sound idea about what to do if that were, were to happen. Um, so I, I should remind everyone that adolescent suicide events are usually impulsive. Um, and, and and so 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 a person might not feel suicidal while they're in the office, but um, they might get suicidal if in the context of a mood disorder or of any psychiatric disorder that involves significant depression or dysphoria. Uh, it's important to to have a plan for what to do if that were to emerge uh, again because the suicidal episodes are are usually happening um, when they're not with the office and they can happen very fast. So that, that, that's why the safety plan is so important. Should I next slide? So a little bit of time talking about mania because we talked about that as an important thing differential and I want to talk about some historical uh, factors that need to be considered uh, as well as examination findings. And so, so, so flags in the history, if you're evaluating someone with depression or, or Instead of activity, increased energy, uh, or destructive behavior, um, ask about overconfidence um, and viosity, um, recklessness. Um, you know, really sort of being um, a lack of caution, a lack of inhibition, um, a lack of um, reasonable kind of constraints or. or or self-restraints on behavior. So one example that comes up um, sometimes is uh, when you hear about kids who have ADHD, oftentimes they are disruptive and, and they might uh, get into arguments uh, with authority figures. Uh, but usually if they have a, an authority figure like a principal or a police officer <laughs> who presents to them, if you, if you really sort of uh, start screaming and cursing at, um, Kind of authority figure who ordinarily would be extremely intimidating to a child. Um, that's kind of a concern. That that sort of uh, raises a question in my mind when I hear that uh, that there's some recklessness and, and potential grandiosity. 
Other historical symptoms include hypersexuality, hyperreligiosity. I don't have this on the list, but uh, sleep disturbance that uh, oftentimes is associated with quite significant um, sleep disturbance, uh, increased energy, um, uh, and just feeling very powerful. Uh, examination findings for mania or hypomania uh, are rapid, loud, and pressured speech, flight of ideas, which is really something about thought process where the idea is kind of uh, being very expansive and, and kind of go from one to the next in, in sort of a, an over exuberant kind of process. Uh, certainly, you can observe sometimes increased energy um, and restlessness in the office uh, with someone who's manic. Uh, and then you can observe the grandiose uh, thinking sometimes. So those are some of the some of the symptoms of mania to keep in mind. And, and if you ever have a concern, uh, there's really no harm in just pick a phone and call the pap, you know, just to run it by him. Uh, because because we certainly don't want to overdiagnose mania. It's it's not a common thing for, for children, um, but uh, it is possible, and it could be sort of a red flag for um, someone who presents with depression. Uh, because it could um, uh, be something that uh, would lead you to, to, to treat the patient with an antidepressant, which wouldn't be helpful um, and could be potentially harmful with someone who's, who's manic. There is a rating scale that you could get. It's, I think, open source. It's called the Child Main Rating Scale, and there's a 21 version item and a, and a uh, version of it, uh, which could be useful to ensure if you have a concern about um, the possibility of mania in a patient who's presenting with either depression or uh, anxiety or, or ADHD or with activity. Uh, next slide. Early psychosis, I promised I'd talk about that a little bit, and, and uh, it is in the differential for some of the things that uh, are common, you know, like anxiety, ADHD, and depression. Um, and this is something just to be aware, we had a webinar about this, but uh, this we associate with an insidious onset really over months, um, you know, six months, 12 months of withdrawn and isolated behavior, uh, dictation of functioning. Um, those symptoms are overlapping very closely with depression, uh, but then we're talking about a very insidious onset. And then um, blunted emotions, uh, suspiciousness, odd behavior, and then just this distraction an internally preoccupied uh, kind of uh, phenomenon that, that is seen sometimes with early psychosis. So if you see symptoms like that, should, should kind of take your interest in the possibility of, of early psychosis, um, and that would definitely warrant a call to MCPAP for, for further consideration. Uh, slide. We're going to be wrapping up soon, but uh, let's talk about how you pull it together. Um, so you've done the history of present illness. Um, you, you've done a little bit of a psychiatric review systems. You've uh, gathered some additional history. You've done a clinical interview. Now it's time for you to reflect and think about what it is you want to treat. You know, what was your primary diagnosis? And and so so as you might imagine, this is probably the hardest part. And, and again, you can call a path anytime if you want help with this. But um, you know, when you think about Max, uh, Max, in the beginning of the session, if you were here at the start, Max presented with um, ADHD symptoms. Uh, and the teachers at school said to the parent, bring him to the pediatrician so you can get evaluated for ADHD. And uh, the parent uh, came dutifully into the pediatrician and um, was able to bring Vanderbilt rating scales, and it looked like ADHD on the Vanderbilt. Uh, we did a little history, not too much. It wasn't very complicated, but a little bit of history and a little bit of uh, interviewing. It became clear that that, that the, the prime diagnosis was depression. And and one of the things that you do in terms of sorting it out is is you want to think about what is the what is the problem that seems to be at the center uh, of the presentation. Uh, and you want to consider causal relationships. And so there's hyperactivity. Or if there's disruptive behavior, what's the cause of that? Like, what, where is that coming from? If you want to match it with uh, syndromes. You, you, you know, that, uh, I think most of most of us know that that ADHD uh, doesn't start at the age of 12, um, and uh, it doesn't start suddenly. You know, like within a year, that it's something that emerges uh, during early childhood. 
and so it becomes manifest uh, as school gets more challenging and expectations uh, get more rigorous in terms of being able to sit still. But, but in this particular case, just talking with the family and talking with the kid about this uh, presentation, uh, it, it became apparent that um, that the child who was depressed and was acting out at school uh, because of uh, feeling depressed. Um, and, uh, and so, so you're thinking about causal relationships, you know, the depression has a causal relationship for the hyperactivity, and you're thinking about the matching of the syndrome uh, to the course, you know, so, so the, the one-year course of symptoms with that, that case of Max uh, didn't uh, sync uh, well with uh, what we know about the course of ADHD. So I want to consider symptoms which are causing the most significant distress or impairment. Um, in terms of picking that primary diagnosis. One of the things, and most of the DSM criteria for different psychiatric syndromes, there's a, 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 a rule out at the end to say that, um, that if this particular, uh, if these symptoms that are in the criteria are kind of the, the result of um, symptom another diagnostic category, then they kind of don't count in a way. So, 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 so you might sort of, if you attribute uh, acting out behaviors to feeling depressed as you understand them from the history, uh, then you might, you know, not count them as criteria for ADHD. Now that said, you know, we need to acknowledge that you can have both things. You know, so, so, so you might have depression and ADHD, and actually it's a fairly common comorbidity. Uh, but you need to meet the criteria of both. And the symptoms uh, needs to correspond uh, to the known course of both conditions. So, so if Max um, had all hyperactive symptoms since kindergarten and, and attentive symptoms since kindergarten, and he also became very negative and depressed and irritable uh, the past year after the death of his past the, the pet and starting a new school, then you might assign both diagnoses. And, and say you're treating a patient with comorbid depression and ADHD, but um, you can exclude certain diagnoses if you feel like the symptoms are are are, are mostly kind of attributed uh, to symptoms of other conditions. One one of the things that you want to do when you're pulling it together is is to remember the resiliency factors and the strengths that you gathered in the history and in the interview. Because it's important to the treatment plan, and and I guess another point that I want to make people understand is that that diagnosis is iterative in, in child psychiatry. Even people who put their whole careers to child psychiatry, uh, they, they give a diagnosis, uh, they make their best call, uh, and as they're going along, uh, things change and it becomes uh, different. Um, and, and, and maybe you were, you were wrong in the diagnosis, and maybe um, the condition uh, seemed to morph or change uh, as people get older, but uh, you should kind of put yourself off the hook uh, in terms of um, uh, making sort of yourself feel as if you have to be right because because you engage uh, successfully with a patient, um, then uh, you'll be there, you know, to kind of learn. Uh, what, what's changing diagnosis, and, and, and the diagnosis comes into focus sometimes over months, uh, sometimes over years, um, and, and so you shouldn't expect yourselves to get the accurate diagnosis every time. And I think that's true of medical conditions as well. Um, and of course, uh, I'll remind you for the time that uh, that uh, you should definitely call McPap uh, whenever you're um, feeling uncertain about uh, a diagnosis. Uh, next slide, Jeremy. Uh, feedback session. Um, so, so we want to have a feedback session. One of the one of the you know once you kind of come up with your own sort of uh, sense of the diagnosis, with or without the help of the path and other sources of consultation, um, you want to sort of have a portion of your session to to give feedback about the diagnosis, uh, to recognize strengths, um, to kind of hope uh, in the process. Um, and, uh, and also to negotiate uh, the treatment plan. That, that on the algorithms, there are always choices. Uh, one of the biggest choices you have to make is: you know, should you proceed with medication uh, as a initial uh, intervention, or should you uh, start with psychotherapy? Um, 
uh, it's not usually a great idea to treat vacation alone, but that's, that can be an option in some instances uh, if uh, psychotherapy is not feasible. But most, 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 most things that we treat um, do uh, call for psychotherapy at least at some points in the course of the condition, not necessarily continuously. Um, so, so you have the options about uh, medication therapy, psychotherapy alone, medications alone, um, and then within those categories, there are choices and 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 there are different options in our clinical alg algorithms as, as well as um, you know outside of them. Uh, next slide. So, so I just want to let people know that um, it's good to think broadly about treatment. Um, that uh, that 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 treatment plans. Um, uh, we like to remind ourselves of this concept uh, that was uh, described by a psychiatrist um, uh, named George Engel. Um, we refer to the biopsychosocial model, and so you think about the the biological, psychological, and social elements because psychiatric illnesses really um, affect all three of those demands of someone's life, and uh, treatment um, can be very valuable if it addresses all these things. And so components are, are, are I, I, the first one, and I think one of the, the most important ones is psychosocial intervention. So what is psychotherapy recommendation? Uh, are there programs that you want to refer the patient to? Uh, that some, there are programs in the community now through the Children's Health Initiative that uh, are um, kind of traditional. Uh, in some ways, and and can be very ecological. So, so they have um, a therapist come to the home uh, to work with child and family in, in home therapy. There's intensive care coordination, which is like a wraparound model. There are therapeutic mentors. Um, they can help you navigate these uh, options. Uh, sometimes school accommodations are an important part of a psychosocial treatment plan. Uh, the next category is self management. You know, so this is kind of something that I think most pediatric primary care providers are very accustomed to because this is all the um, uh, kinds of anticipatory guidance uh, kinds of recommendations that you might make. Uh, for depression, behavioral activation is very important, so encouraging people to stay active. Um, for anxiety disorders, um, uh, we like to encourage exposure, um, at least um, you know, sort of uh, moderate levels of exposure. So, so we're asked for a patient with anxiety to, to send a note to the school to excuse a child from gym class. You might uh, pause and say, "Hmm, this actually might be an opportunity for us to kind of do some work to try to help your child to uh, get sort of uh, desensitized to the nervousness that they have when they're participating in gym." And so, instead of Restricting that, you might sort of suggest that the child um, have a, a plan uh, with the culture or the physical ed teacher to be involved uh, and to gradually sort of um, increase that involvement uh, in some way that uh, is tolerable for the child. And so management uh, includes sleep hygiene, exercise, nutrition, uh, relationships to parents about structure. And finally, psychiatric medication is another pillar obviously addressing the biological aspects of the treatment plan. Um, and, uh, and you have algorithms and uh, best practice recommendations for the use of psychiatric medications for common uh, psychiatric diagnosis um, diagnosticories. Um, and so these are negotiated as well because some parents uh, are very resistant to the idea of medication. One nice reason to send a for a MCPAP face-to-face -face consultation is that the parents very you have medication uh, and you feel strongly that the patient needs medication, that the consultation could be a nice opportunity for the parent to have um, kind of a consultation with a specialist uh, that may be able to um, reassure them and provide them with more uh, in-depth information about the treatment options. Uh, safety planning, we were talking about that before, so, so always consider that as part of your comprehensive treatment plan for someone who is potentially at risk for suicidal uh, behavior or, or violent behavior. And then finally, monitoring and follow-up is part of the treatment plan that um, 
that psychiatric illnesses are not sort of one and done uh, treatment, as, as you know. Uh, and so we really think that they should be monitored uh, on a periodic basis. Uh, and recommendations for monitoring are in the, uh, the algorithms that, that we've um, developed. Um, and um, and uh, we also encourage using measures uh, to track uh, symptom severity and, and also to, to maybe have some resources to track whether or not people are getting the services that you've referred them to, to a, you know, particularly the psychosocial interventions. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and, um, let's see if we have any questions. I, um, Jeremy, I don't see any questions on my list of questions, um, but um, a few minutes left, and I'd be glad to entertain some questions. And like raise your hand, um, and you could be unmuted if you want to ask a question. Um, Not seeing any questions, um, I don't want to rush, rush anybody, but um, I think if we um, don't have questions, we can, we can a few minutes early, but maybe sort of stay another couple minutes in case uh, people are being shy. People can write in their questions. Oh, we do have a question. Oh, question from Ruby. Hi, Ruby. Um, uh, models of what is included in a safety plan. Uh, we, we can actually get them for you and put them in on the on the website or, or send them to you by email. But but in general, I haven't used particularly for safety plans. I've actually uh, written them down sort of um, kind of negative uh, in my note. Um, and 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 sometimes uh, it, it can be helpful if you have a patient uh, who you feel with it from having something in writing where you kind of write down uh, on a, a sort of a nation sheet, sort of a list of, um, of things that they would do. And, and so, so it's really limited to simply, if we're to have X, Y, and Z symptom, here is what um, plan is that you would do, that you would notify this per person. Um, and in this particular way, if that person isn't available, you would notify another person you might have a backup. I'm just making sure that the people who be notified are um, prepared to know what to do if this thing happens. And, and oftentimes it's the parent, sometimes it's the therapist, it could be you, um, but that's just an important piece. Um, but I saw a, a message and, and I will try to find some kind of template because uh, it would be a nice, it probably would be a nice tool I think for people to have. Sebastian Ruby. Here's a question from Michelle Sanders. Uh, could you talk about suicide ideation and concern for immediate referral to emergency services? I've sent patients to ED for SI and they get discharged. Oh, yeah, that's actually a really good question. I, I've spoken to that before. I always, um, when I send patients to crisis, I call the crisis team ahead um, and let them know that why I sent them what I want them to do, <laughs> and I'll also tell them that if they um, decide that they want to do something differently from what I'm recommending, because I've already evaluated this patient and you have too, I always say that I want them to call me so I can consult with them and I give them my cell phone number. The crisis teams sometimes say that, um, that they are able to get through to people, uh, whether it's true or not, uh, if you call them ahead and if you give them your cell phone number, uh, you're willing to, uh, then they can't uh, say that. And I think that's actually worked for me in the past uh, as a pretty reliable way of kind of getting some sort of uh, closure on sort of these decisions. And, and, and so in the past, before I did that, I used to have the same experience as you in terms of sending ED and finding that they were discharged and uh, getting um, upset uh, myself and parents being upset. 
um, and then lose opportunity, especially when they wait for like eight hours in the emergency room for their evaluation. All right. Well, thanks so much for those questions and thanks for your attention and um, and I really appreciate everyone's uh, participation. Uh, I think we'll end and please uh, fill out your survey at the end uh, that you'll get uh, so we can sort of continue to improve this uh, program.